So welcome to Applied Mathematical Finance. Yeah, so now I like to start, uh, say what somewhat larger section on interest rates. We will first define interest rates and actually I will also have um, yeah, an even simpler introduction, yeah, just repeating a few things, which I assume you already know. And in the end, so maybe the end of the session or the next session, uh, we will have, say, a collection of different interest rates. Because although I will start quite axiomatically from a single financial product, the Zero Cooper Bond, we will finally arrive at different versions, different types of definition, continuous, discrete, yeah, compounding. Um, and all these rates could be then used to build a model. So a little bit, this discussion on interest rates is also the discussion on what is a good quantity to build the model on. The quantities are all in some, to some extent equivalent, but in some coordinate frames, if you think of coordinates, it's much easier to build a model than in others. So maybe at the end, we have this little table here where I have three different interest rates from which you can derive three families uh, of models. Yeah, they are some subtypes and really rich. And we like to understand these models. And just after I have this table, I then discuss with you the relation of the different interest rates. So we will arrive at this uh, picture. So hopefully you get a first intuition on what is the difference. And uh, later we will then build stochastic models on this, which will look, maybe I have a small teaser here, which will look a little bit like this. So uh, you now can have a stochastic simulation of these things and we can gain then deeper understanding of the models. Okay, so that's a little bit the aim of this session, yeah, maybe also the next one, to lay this uh, foundation. Yeah, let's start with a small introduction. So nothing is stochastic here on the slide. And yeah, just repeat what you maybe already have intuitively in mind if you think of interest rate. So if we borrow or lend an amount, say now capital N here today, so today is the time little t here. So we are based in time little t. You know, then we expect that we receive back or we pay back, yeah, depending on, on which side we are. Um, a different amount. So we will receive back the original amount N, but there could be an additional payment. So there is some additional, so it's one times N, and then there is N times R. Yeah? So we receive some additional amount back. Usually what we receive in addition is considered to be proportional to N. Okay, so that's the reason why I wrote here N times R. Yeah, so I believe R is then independent of N. Of course, if you do twice this transaction, you would receive twice the amount. So if you contract twice the amount, you receive twice the additional payment. Um, it's also reasonable to yeah, assume that this payment somewhat depends on the time span. So for that reason, I have here the time span as at least an argument in this um, additional amount. And the reason why we receive this is that this additional amount compensates for the fact that uh, yeah, we have to wait for receiving the money back. We could have done something different with the money. Uh, also later, we will have another aspect. It could compensate for the risk that we lose the money, but 
when we start now discussing interest rate, this risk is ex excluded. Yeah, so there's no default risk. Everything is risk free. It's guaranteed to receive the amount back. Yeah, one other important part. The amount that we receive back is known in T, in little t, because we assume that we make the contract in little t. Uh, so we already agree in little t, uh, what is the interest rate that we have in this contract? What do we receive back? Because of this situation that um, the time span enters, it's often expressed so relative to time, yeah. So we annualize it. So we divide by the time span, and then we have the word rate, yeah, because it is per time, yeah. So interest rate it refers to that we express the additional amount in a, on a per time basis. So that's clear. Now another aspect, compounding, you could repeat this. Yeah? So if I draw now, say a little picture. Yeah? So here I have my time axis. Okay, and I now invest my, uh, say, starting amount. Say this is my N0. Okay, then you expect that at a later point in time, you receive back the N0. So I receive back my N0 here but I also receive back an additional amount that compensates a little bit for this. So if I have that, I start with N0 here, oops. Then I receive back N0, so one times N0 plus the and zero multiplied with the interest rate multiplied with the time span. I'm looking here at an equidistributed time discretization, so it's a delta t. So we receive back this little additional amount here. Yeah? So this guy multiplied with my additional and zero. And now you can repeat this strategy. Yeah? So you could now say, okay, let's repeat it. You take the whole money and you just reinvest it again. So that means you start off here with the, now call it N1. Yeah? So this guy is the N1. I start off with this and I repeat this. So I will re receive back my N1 in the next period. And now proportional to N1, I will receive back an additional amount, N1 times one plus an interest rate. So I will receive back, say, this amount here, which I then could call N2. Yeah, so my N N2 is that I have N1 plus N1 multiplied with the interest rate. Now for the period from T1 to T2, yeah? so now the interest rate observed in T1 and for the end period T2. Yeah? So this is T1, this is T2. So you could then, of course, plug in here that you already know that N1 is a product and you have that everything is your initial quantity. So you are in zero and then repeatedly multiplied with terms that have a one plus the interest rate. Yeah? So first for the period from T0 to T1 and then for the period from T2, T2, T1. If you repeat this, you get some exponential growth. Yeah? So you have Ni is N0 times one plus F. Yeah, so assume that F is now constant, it's always the same. Then I could just write one plus F times delta T to the power of I. Otherwise it's a product of the one plus Fi, if you like. Uh, you can also write this, of course, in exponential form, defining if f is now constant r to be the logarithm of one plus f delta t divided by delta t, then you can write this like this. Okay, so this is just called compounding, yeah, that if you have a guaranteed interest rate for a fixed time, you have some exponential growth. That's all the classical stuff here. Nothing is stochastic. Uh, and yeah, I just um, want to illustrate that we could also have 
different interest rates for different time periods. Yeah, So it could be that the growth you observe from here to here is maybe a different one that you observe from here to here. So now I would like to consider models where interest rates become stochastic. So stochastic interest rate, a small remark on modeling. If you recall our little yeah, recapitulation or the previous lectures, then you remember that we already discussed many different models, like Schultz model, Bachelier model. And in these models, our underlying was a one-dimensional stochastic process. So there was here, for example, the value of a stock, yes, in the Black Scholes model. But now, if I just mentioned that the interest rate for the different time periods could be different, yeah, it could be that you have actually a family of different stochastic processes. Because if you go back to this picture here, well, the second time here is a free parameter. You could also immediately say that you would like to have a contract from here to there, or you could have a contract from here to there, or a contract from here to there, right? And it also looks that there is a complicated relation between immediately contracting something from here to there or saying I have a contract from here to there, and then I have a new contract from T1 to T2 from here to there. So what is the relation between? So you see all these things are now maybe complicated connected. If you just consider that we sit in T0 and the end time is a free parameter. So we, so we say, okay, I'd like to borrow money for two years, for three years and whatever then we could observe different interest rates for these long periods. So we observe an interest rate curve parameterized by a time parameter. So I have here the capital T, which is parameterizing this quantity. And I observe this quantity in little t. So little t is the parameter that describes the stochastic process, how it's evolve or evolving. But now I have a whole family of interest rates. Yeah? So we have um, a, a random variable for every capital T. Yeah? So we have an interest rate F, F capital T observed in little t for any given maturity. And this is um, a random variable. So we have T maps to F, capital T observed in little t is a stochastic process. So like in the market of a stock where you could have different stock, a basket, yeah, three different stocks. Now you have different interest rates, but you have a continuous family of stochastic processes. So much richer structure and maybe complicated interconnections. So for two different times, two such interest rates could be different. No, so that's reasonable. For example, if you have some kind of crisis, it could be that everybody is, is expecting that you have a specific interest rate for the next year and the next second year. But maybe then everybody is expecting that this will fade out and the interest rate for a longer time horizon is maybe different. So if you have this picture in mind that here is time and now this is the maturity when you receive the money back. This is the observation time. This is your little t. Then you consider here the two different interest rates, say from here to t1 or say for a longer period, say from here to t2. So this guy here is t2. This guy is t1. Then you would also expect that there is some relation because the 
true interest rates for these time periods, they share a common time interval, namely from here to here. Yeah? So there should be some correlation structure. And the correlation structure, yeah, so the correlation should be larger if they share a larger amount of time. So if the two are close to each other, you know, but comparably far from little t, so one would expect that the two rates are also close to each other. So they have some correlation structure. And this makes it actually difficult to write a good model because how would you now guess a good correlation structure? Yeah, so it's not so obvious. So maybe I would like to decompose the interest rates in a similar way as we had on the second slide with this compounding. Yeah? So as we had here. Yeah? So instead of thinking you contract here and you receive back at the future point in time here, it's that you consider that you have some compounding and only these atomic little sub intervals are maybe good quantities for a model. So this is that I assume that from T0 to T2 can be decomposed into from T0 to T1 and T1 to T2. So I could just define rates that span an interval from T0 to T1 and from T1 to T2 and so on to then represent the interval from little t to tk. Yeah? So assume that little t is T0, then I go from little t, so T0 to T1 and so on. And the last interval is tk minus one to tk here. Yeah? So this is now the picture. This here is your little t, which is also equal to the t0. And you have different intervals to tk. And you represent the interest rate from here to there by little products of interest rates one plus L. Yeah, so I now define the rate L, one plus L Ti to Ti plus one times delta Ti. Yeah, this only resembles the um, compounding we had on the previous slides because there is a really big important difference. Yeah? Um, on the left-hand side, so now I talk about stochastic processes. On the left-hand side, there is a stochastic process that I observe in little t. So you would say this guy is f little t measurable. Me means you know it in little t. Hence, on the right-hand side, I decompose this in quantities that are all f little t measurable. So important point is that here, I always observe everything in little t. So I observe an interest rate here for the period from ti to ti plus one, expected in little t or observed in little t. If you go back to my introduction in this compounding, it's always that you observe the interest rate for the next period at the starting point of the period from T0 to T1, observed in T1 for T2. Yeah? So you always go to the bank and say, I would like to renew. What is the new interest rate? I would like to renew it. Yeah? So there is a difference to this thing here. Here you say that you contract from the beginning for the period in the future this interest rate. So this is not the same strategy as um, on the second slide here. And for that reason, I have here that this, whoops, where is that? So for that reason, I have here that this is only a definition of the objects on the right. So this 
is now a small picture. Yeah? I have a discretization of this interstate curve. I and I observe that these guys now move. And now the connection is a little bit yeah, decoupled. Maybe there's still correlation, but you could maybe much easier assume some, some kind of independence of these guys, so some kind of independent movements. Of course, if you have this equation, 65, which defines F for the whole period is the product of the small periods. You can just by induction, yeah, solve for the Ls, okay? Just take the difference. Yeah? I mean, F is like an integral, L is like a differential. Uh, take the difference of two Fs, the F from uh, little t to say Ti, okay, here minus one, and F from little t to Ti, okay, then you can, by taking the ratio, minus one divided by the time, you get, of course, the L from Ti minus one to Ti. Huh? The L is called then forward rate. And maybe already some kind of definition, this time discretization, which I yeah, secretly introduced here, is called tenor structure. It's a time discretization of the interest rate curve. Okay, so that was a little just introduction. Um, actually, the quantity L is later the one which I prefer for the modeling, and there is a big industry standard model that um, uses this, this forward rate. I would like to take a kind of reset now and start defining interest rate in, in a more axiomatic way. So I start by the, um, yeah, discussing the so-called single curve theory. So there is only a single interest rate curve, but my presentation is already say compatible with the extension to the so-called uh, multi-curve theory. So I start axiomatic and we will now define a financial product and the interest rate will all derive from this atomic financial product. All the quantities in this sections here are random variables or stochastic processes and they are all defined over the same probability space. I drop very often the assumptions on the probability space. Uh, actually in this section, it's just definition yeah, of how the different random variables or stochastic processes uh, are related. So my atomic object, the guy that is actually on the basis is the zero coupon bond. Yeah? So this guy is called zero coupon bond. Often I just say the bond. And this is the guaranteed payment of one unit of currency in a future point in time, say T2. So I have here my time axis, this here is T2. I observe this product, for example, at a time little t, okay? And now I can look at the market, what is the value of receiving one unit of currency? So I receive back here one unit of currency at T2. What is the value of this financial product? So how much money do I have to pay in little t to receive this back? And this amount I call P T2 observed in little t. And as little t moves on, this quantity can change. So it is a stochastic process, yeah? It can, could change randomly. So you see that reasonably, maybe this amount is a bit smaller than one, such that you receive here back something, uh, something in 
access yeah, to this one unit, which you could then think of being the interest rate. But to some extent, this is a different view. Yeah, Instead of saying I start with one unit and I receive something more. Yeah? So now I'm asking myself, what is the value of the financial product of receiving one unit at a future point in time? And of course, this receiving one unit depends on where this time lies. Yeah? So I have the financial product. P is the value of receiving something in time T2. I observe it in little t, and all the quantities are, well, random variables. So there is maybe here an omega. So I'm now in state t omega. So this means that pt2 is a stochastic process. Pt2 observed in little t is a random variable. And this here is then a value yeah, in having unit one currency. All these guys could be different, yeah, different stochastic processes for different times capital T2. Is this a good object to build a model upon it? Maybe not because it has the same problem that if the maturity capital T2 of one product is very close to the maturity of another product, say capital T1, then I would expect that there is a high correlation between these two products right? because they have a very sim similar um, payment time, especially if little t is far away from this maturity. And it's maybe difficult to model this effect. Also note that if you arrive at the final point, so if you arrive in T2, so your little t is equal to T2, then the value of receiving this one unit is just one. So I have some kind of final condition, which is also a problem if I would like to model a stochastic process that exactly hits the final condition. But apart from that, this thing is nice because it has just a single parameter that uh, distinguishes the objects and there's no other convention involved. Yeah, There's no time discretization, no way of compounding involved. So this is what I like uh, as a mathematician, I have a very clean atomic object on the basis. So this is just a summary, yeah. So what I said, so this is the amount we have to invest at time little t to receive one unit in capital T2, of course, you can just scale this. So if your scaling factor is now one unit of currency divided by PT2 little t and omega, if you just scale this, so you buy now that many units of this financial product, then it means that in little t and omega, you pay one unit of currency because now if you plug in little t and omega, this stuff here cancels and you pay one unit of currency and you receive back at the final point in time, one divided by one currency unit divided by P, T2, T and omega times one currency unit. Okay, so yeah, now you invest one unit and you receive back one divided by P, yeah, P of T2. Um, so one divided by is actually one plus the excess amount which we receive. Okay, so you can 
use this guy to inter uh, infer here the um, interest rate. Um, actually, the slide is a little bit sloppy yeah, because uh, I drop the currency units here on top. But here below, I was a little bit strict, yeah, some, somewhat very strict. So if you go back to the definition, uh, I should write here one currency. And if you are a physicist, you would say, okay, what is the unit of P? The unit of P is the unit of your currency yeah, you are in. So there is um, a remark here on currencies, which I will make later. So actually it's this remark here. Um, currently everything is in a single currency and I sometimes drop the superscript of the currency because it is obvious. But uh, as you maybe remember from physics, uh, it's uh, nice and uh, very helpful to think that all the quantities have units. Yeah, what is the unit of an interest rate? What is the unit of a bond? Yeah? So one guy is one currency, the other guy is one divided by time and, uh, and other, other things are unitless. Yeah? And um, this is uh, really nice to sometimes have in mind this um, relation because you can easily check if an equation makes sense. And later in this lecture, I like to move to a multi-currency world yeah, where we model different interest rates in different um, economies in different currencies. And then it really is important to distinguish this aspect. Okay, so I have now my um, object, the zero copper bond. Small remark, I already made this. My zero copper bond here is default free. Yeah? So we consider it default free. It is guaranteed to receive this payment. So the interest rate only encodes the cost for waiting uh, a certain amount in time. But um, it may not happen that there is some default event, some bankruptcy that we do not receive this back. So later we will maybe also introduce bonds that have this risk. Yeah? Then it is an issuer specific bond. So different companies, different people uh, have different risk of paying back. And this will then lead to a theory where we have multiple interest rates. Everyone could generate its own interest rate curve. Throughout this section, I will sometimes make a remark when it's important where this um, difference could kick in. Yeah, So I try to be I already extendable. To this, to this case. So now comes an inter interesting product. I just define now from my zero copper bond, the stochastic process, P T1, T2, which is the ratio P T2 divided by P T1. So this guy is called the forward bond now I assume T1 is smaller or equal T2, and I define the forward bond as the ratio PT2 divided by PT1. If you think of physical units, okay, so this guy is dividing one currency by one currency. So this guy is unit less, yeah? So it's not an, an, uh, a payment we receive. It could be, however, the um, um, amount, yeah? So the part without the unit of, of a payment. Yeah, what is this object? So the forward bond derives from the following trading strategy. First, recall the PT1 bond. So this here is by PT1 in little t. 
So to buy it, I have to pay the price of this zero copper bond. So I pay here the price. So I have a minus in front because I pay. It's minus PT1 observed in little t. And in T1, I receive back one unit. Well, you could also buy two units of this guy or three units of this guy. So you could buy different amounts. Um, let's buy a special amount. And buying a special amount means I just multiply now with a fraction and I multiply with PT2 observed in T divided by P. T1, observed in two. Yeah, you could just ask, okay, what is the price for the T2 bond? What is the price for the T T1 bond? Maybe T2 is uh, lower, yeah? Uh, T1 is a little bit higher because you receive back the money earlier. So this is a number smaller than one, say it's 0 0.8, yeah? You could just ask, okay, I would like 80% of um, a T1 bond, okay? scale it with 1000, okay, then you would have 800 uh, PT1 bonds. Okay, so I just buy a fraction. Yeah? So while this here is by one unit of PT1 in little t, this here is by PT2 divided by PT1 units of PT1 in little t. So you see, it's just scaled here with the number of units that I buy. Actually, this ratio is just the forward bond, which I have to find. Yeah, now uh, what you have here in front is that you have this cancels and you just pay the amount that corresponds to the value of a T2 bond, right? So this is exactly the same value as receiving just one unit in T2. Okay, so this is PT2 observed in little t. So I can just compare this to the T2 bond. Huh? So this guy here is the same as paying P2 observed in little t. So this guy is now by PT2 in little t. So now I have two financial products, buying a fraction of the T1 bond or buying a fraction of the T2 bond that have the same value. And as mentioned in the beginning, I have the same conditions for buying and selling. So I could now sell the product on the top and buy the product on the bottom. Yeah? So I also assume that I could short, do short selling. So I now like to multiply this here. So maybe I take a different color. I multiply this here with a minus and this here with a plus. Yeah, so this means I issue, yeah, I sell, I issue a T1 bond. I receive back some money and I invest this money in the T2 bond. So if you multiply the thing on the top with a minus, it just flips all these arrows. So this guy goes up, this guy goes down. And if you now build a portfolio of the two, you will see that actually these two here cancel. Okay, and you will get this guy where you have to pay back, where you uh, actually pay back the PT1 bond. So in the end, if I take now the portfolio of selling a fraction of a T1 bond and buying 
for this, the G2 bond, I have the following cash flow. The cash flows here in little t cancel, and I have the forward cash flow structure that in T1, I have to pay PT2 divided by PT1 times one unit of currency. And I receive back one unit. Okay, so maybe there should be also currency here. One unit of currency in T2. So now I have the a construction that looks like a zero Cooper bond. Yeah, pay something here at the beginning, yeah, which is smaller than one if PT2 here is smaller than PT1 and receive one unit at the future point in time. But there is a crucial difference in this construction. And the crucial thing is that the quantities are all observed in little t. So I made the contract in little t. I made the contract in little t but all the cash flows are now moved to the future, which means that I, just by observing the zero copper bond price curve, I can observe now, say, interest rates for future time periods, because this is what I invest here at T1, and this is what I receive back. So you could say that this small additional amount here, if you go from here to here, this small additional amount here constitutes an interest rate, but it's an interest rate observed in little t for a future time period. Okay, so the forward bond, which I defined on the previous slides, is actually a unitless quantity, but it is the amount you have to invest in T1 to receive one unit in T2 contracted. Yeah? So observed from the stochastic uh, positive point of view, measurable in little t. But this is the cash flow of a forward bond. Just written here what I just said, yeah, the forward bond corresponds to the amount that has to be invested in T1, guaranteeing a payment of one unit of currency in T2. If the contract is finalized in little t, yeah, and state um, omega. If you Flip it, yeah. If you look at, say, this is PT2 divided by PT1. If you look at PT1 divided by PT2, then this is the amount you receive back in T2 if you invest one unit in T1. So obviously, uh, we have, if we replace the T1, the starting time with the little t, then this agrees with the zero copper bond for the time T2. And you know, if you replace the um, T1 with the T2, yeah, so P T2, T2, then this is always equal to one. So now I can derive from this object, the forward rate. So I'm now here at time little t. I now know the amount that I have to invest here to receive a guaranteed amount here. So this is my t1, t2. And I can look at the interest rate that I receive over this period, which I then define the forward rate. Okay, and the interesting thing is this is not like in the compounding, yeah, all the guys are now observed in the time little t. So um, again, the re remark, uh, I'm still in a single 
curve environment. So single curve means I have a single set of continuum of zero copper bonds. So accessible to all market participants, say up to a given time horizon. And we will, this is an idealization and we will look at the generalization later. So now I can define the forward rate. I define the forward rate, actually the quantity L I already had in my introduction. So I now have the situation I'm in little t, everything is observed in little t. I just drop the parameter little t here because all quantities are stochastic processes. So it's implicit yeah, that their observation time should be the same if you plug it in. So the situation is that I have a time t1 and t2 here. And if you just multiply the cash flow of a forward bond with one divided by pt1, t2, yeah, so with the inverse of the forward bond, so then you have, you invest one unit of currency here. Uh, it's one divided by pt1, t2 times pt1, t2, and you receive back one currency unit times the fraction, yeah, one divided by pt2, uh, so, well, sorry, one divided by pt1, t2. So, and this guy I now represent as one, so the original amount which I have invested. So let's draw a small, so this is one plus an additional amount. Okay, and this, this additional amount is now this guy. So the additional amount is the dark blue part here. Yeah. And this is my forward rate. Well, forward rate, but it should be a rate. Yeah. So forward rate times the time period. Okay, so the definition is the forward rate is one divided by the period length times, okay, it's one divided by P T one T two minus one. But if you then plug in here, the definition, it is, PT1 divided by PT2 minus one, and you could then rewrite this to PT1 minus PT2 divided by PT2. So you can now define this interest rate from observing the zero copper bonds, and all the guys are observed at a common time. You now have not only a one parametric family, of stochastic process, you have a two parametric family parameterized by the starting point of the period and the end point of the period. Of course, since I derived it from a one parametric family, there is a strong relation. Yeah? If you have overlapping periods and so on. But okay, that's, that's now my definition of the simple forward rate. We will later use this quantity as um, the building block of, of our models, but there are other quantities. So let's study the other guys. You could also express the 
rate or the, the amount on the right-hand side using an exponential function. Yeah. You receive back something which is proportional to the original amount. The original amount was one. You will receive back a quantity that is larger or equal zero. Yeah. Okay, it doesn't make sense that you pay something. Okay, you, you just sit there and you check if you receive something. So you could also represent the guy on the right hand side, the one plus interest rate as an exponential function. And this receiving back an exponential function resembles a little bit what we did here. Yeah. So in my little introduction where interest rates were not stochastic, you, you saw that these one plus interest rate times time period structure with the product here came from a reinvestment strategy. And you could just define a continuous time rate here to move to an exponential, which then resembles having infinitesimal small period at which you um, invest. Yeah? You know, the exponential function is actually the limit if you make the time periods uh, smaller and smaller. So it's perfectly okay to also say that we would like to represent this product structure by an exponential function. So this then gives me here the continuously compounded forward rate. Yeah? So now you also know why it is continuously compounded because it is landed from the strategy that we have continuous compounding, but actually this is just landed because in a continuous compounding, you would maybe always get a new interest rate. And here it's a stochastic process that is observed at the same time than the stuff on the left-hand side. Yeah? So it's just the definition. So again, now what I just place here, the definition symbol, yeah, I would like to define this excess amount by some exponential r times the time period. If you solve this for the r, the r is minus the logarithm of the forward bond divided by the time period. Okay, since the forward bond is the ratio of pt2 divided by pt1, this is minus the logarithm of the bond in t2 minus logarithm bond of T1 divided by the time period length. Just an alternative definition. And as a mathematician, you would maybe say, okay, maybe I like the exponential function here because it is not so much um, connected with, the, with this time discretization. Yeah? And yeah, it just looks here like um, a finite difference, a slope, okay? So this is the continuously compounded forward rate or sometimes called also here the yield. Well, um, what happens if you make the time periods infinitesimal small? Huh? So my, my little time discretization, maybe it was a little bit artificial, okay? And we could now look at the interest rate from T to T2, but we make the time period here of from T to T2 smaller and smaller. Then I get something like an interest rate for an infinitesimal small time period. And I get back a one parametric family, but now a one parametric family of interest rates. But this looks like a nice object. So this is now my instantaneous forward rate, which I define as F little t capital T, which is the limit of the L from capital T to T2 observed in little t. Yeah? So all the stochastic processes, all the quantities are still observed at a fixed point, little t. So this is the forward rate for an infinitesimal time period. And it really looks like a nice object. It's one parametric family and 
you can also show it's just an equivalent encoding of your zero Cooper bond price curve now in terms of interest rates. Yeah, and uh, you do not have overlapping periods. Yeah, if you have, say, T1 to T3 and T2 to T3 and so on, you just have now infinite small periods. Maybe this is a nice object to use in the model. Yeah, because instead of zero copper bonds that have different maturities and share um, a common time period, these guys are just points. They do not share time periods in the sense um, yeah, that they accrue interest over a common time period. So this could be a nice object for um, a model. In the definition here, I used on the right-hand side the L but actually you can also show that this is the same as using the R. We'll actually can show that this guy just is the slope of the zero Cooper bond price curve. Okay, so why is that? Um, we plug in the definition. So F little t capital T is the limit of the forward rate. Then we plug in the definition of the forward rate. So the forward rate is the bond at the beginning of the period, PT1, minus the bond at the end of the period, PT2, divided by the bond at the end of the period. So actually it was PT1 divided by PT2 minus one and then the whole thing is divided by the period length. So this green part here is just the definition of this forward rate, but now using um, capital T as the T1. So then you see that this limit here is just finite difference. So you can move this limit to here. It's just the finite difference. Actually, take a minus out by flipping the two. Right. I have a minus. And you see that this converges just to the derivative. So if I now perform the limit, it will just converge to the derivative of the bond price with respect to yeah, with respect to the time parameter. So with respect to capital T, in capital T. And this guy here converges just to P capital T observed in little t. And the derivative of P divided by P, well, it's the derivative of the logarithm of the zero copper bond price curve. So I have that this is just the minus the derivative of the logarithm of the zero copper bond price curve. So take the logarithm of the zero copper bond price curve and this instantaneous forward rate is minus the slope of that curve. Clearly now it's an equivalent um, representation. So getting out now the whole zero copper bond price curve from the instantaneous forward uh, curve, which is the derivative of the zero copper bond price curve. I need also the initial condition, but I have that the zero copper bond that pays immediately in little t observed in little t is equal to one. Okay, so that's now the initial condition that completes that this is just an equivalent representation. It appears as if uh, now this f is the good object to model interest rate. It does not have this problem that the capital T uh, somehow has some overlapping information, yeah, like in the zero cobra bond curve. It is a one parametric family. It's equivalent to the zero cobra bond curve. And indeed, this is the foundation yeah, for the heath shaw morton framework. However, later when we move to the computer, we have to discretize anyway. And the funny thing is that when we discretize, we then will end up with the L anyway. Huh? So, I have um, a somewhat a focus on, on the, the forward rate because that is later the guy that will appear in our 
implementations. So it's maybe more important to study directly the model on L. A last, yeah, and maybe interesting thing is the short rate. And maybe you know this if you have already read a little bit about interest rate models, because many books or courses start by first discussing short rate models. I don't like this approach, and I will explain why I don't like it. Um, but first, just define the short rate. So we have the short rate R, and the short rate R is just this, say, now you could take many different of the guys. Let's take this yield I defined. So the exponential R, little t, capital T, or T1, T2, multiplied with T2 minus T1, no, this exponential representation. So maybe just to recall this, okay, what was this guy? So it was that we had P T2 divided by P T1 defined this continuously compounded forward rate here, this R T1 T2, this yield. We take this guy here and we plug in for T1, actually the little t. So we are already in the observation point. The observation point is the starting period. And this here is then a parameter which we let go to little t. So actually it is the interest rate I observe for the period that is infinitesimal small because the capital T goes to the little t and starts in my current observation point. So this is just a single point. Yeah? So it only depends on the little t. Yeah? It's the interest rate that I just observe for the next infinitesimal small period. So if you take this limit, yeah, you see that since this R here is actually taking the logarithm of this, so take the logarithm of the ratio of the bonds and divide this logarithm by T, P, T2 minus T1. It is also like um, a finite difference. Yeah? So letting capital T go to little t, it is differentiate the logarithm of this guy. Yeah, this here is the P capital T observed in little t. And this here is the P little t, little t. This is just one. So it's to differentiate the logarithm of P capital T, little t with respect to capital T and then plug in for the capital T, the little t. Yeah, Because I go from the capital T to the observation part. Okay, there is also here um, a minus. Um, differentiate the logarithm is differentiate the bond divided by the bond. Okay, but if you plug in for capital T, the little t, then this guy here will be equal to one. So it is just differentiate the zero copper bond curve with respect to maturity at the starting starting point. So if the zero copper bond curve with respect to maturity would look like this. Okay, so here is my little t. This here is my, say, maturity. Okay, so I have some kind of curve here. So the curve will start in one because p t observed in little t is equal to one. And then maybe it declines because waiting for the money is a smaller value. So this here is the curve T maps to P. I have to wait until capital T. I observe everything in, in little t. Yeah, then the R is just minus the slope here. Yeah, 
So if this here is one unit, this here is the minus R. Okay, this here is this, the slope. This is the short rate. Yeah. And at any point here, yeah, okay. The slope, yeah, actually the slope of the logarithm is then minus the slope of the logarithm is then associated with the forward rate. Okay, so this is another special thing. It is the short rate is just the rate at um, the observation point little t for the infinitesimal time period. The funny thing is that you can also build models only based on the short rate. This appears a little bit yeah, suspicious. Yeah? This is strange because how can it be that a single point encodes all the information of this curve? And this can be only under a special additional condition, which is not a big restriction, but which makes somehow the modeling using the short rate special. And the additional condition is that you know the process under the equivalent martingale measure associated with the numerator that contains this process. Okay, maybe this was a complicated uh, um, phrase, yeah, but um, I will explain it. But just as a remark, short rate models are a little bit special in the modeling sense, yeah, um, since they have this this additional yeah assumption, yeah, which is not not, not a restriction, but it is an additional assumption that you already know the model under the uh, risk neutral measure. Usually, we say we know the model under the real measure, under the real probability measure, and we move to the risk neutral measure. That's the natural way, and that's also the natural way I would like it to do. And that's the reason why I do not start discussing short rate models. Yeah, we will discuss short rate models maybe later. Nevertheless, short rate models were very popular because they represent a single scalar quantity that encodes all the information. So this was very similar to what you have for a stock in the Black Schultz model, a single stock which you use as your modeling primitive you know, to model the financial market. So there was some uh, resemblance. Yeah, so that made short rate modeling popular. But for understanding interest rate modeling, it's maybe not a good quantity. Yeah? So for didactical reason, I do not like to do this. So note that um, in the previous definitions, we define really families of stochastic processes, so a rich structure, and why the definition of the short rate here is a single scalar stochastic process. The short rate is the limit of the forward rate of the, uh, so the simple forward rate or of the uh, yield, yeah? So that does not make a difference. You will end up with the same expression. Before I give you a deeper understanding of these different rates, let me just introduce um, two financial products now based on these interest rates, the rolling bond and the accrual account, which now actually really do this reinvestment strategy using stochastic interest rates um, that we had uh, in, in our introduction. The reason why I do this, why I define this object is because these objects are now financial products and they are candidates for then numerators, which we will use. Yeah? You know, if we like to move to an equivalent martingale measure, we have to choose a numerator. A numerator can be a financial product. A zero Cooper bond could be a numerator and we will also sometimes make this choice, but there are some numerators which are quite nice from a numerical, you know, from a numerical aspect, you know, lower numerical error, or also from a modeling perspective. This is also maybe a remark here where interest rate modeling differs from what you learn when you look at the Black Schultz model. When you look at the Black Schultz model, the change of numerator or the freedom to choose the numerator doesn't seem to be a big thing because you will just use the e to the rt as a numerator and it's a deterministic thing. It moves out of the expectation. 
So choice of numeraria doesn't seem to be a big choice. For interest rate modeling, this is a big difference. Yeah? There is really a huge family of choices here and sometimes a choice, different choice can make the calculation much easier or even the numerical implementation much more accurate. And we will study this. So let me introduce now two new financial products. So the financial products we had is the family of zero corporate bonds. From these, we derived interest rates. And now let's introduce these financial products. So what we do is we start by investing one unit of currency in time T0. So maybe I have here this tenor discretization. So now I assume I have a time discretization of the interest rate curve and I invest one unit of currency here at this time. So what I will receive back is one plus, and if I now use the simple forward rate, L for the period from T0 to T1 multiplied with the period length, which is T1 minus T0. Huh? So I invest here one unit and I accrue some interest over this period. I have contracted this in T0. So observe that I contract this here in T0. Now I repeat this contract, but which with the interest rate I observe at the beginning of this period. So if this amount is now reinvested for another period and this process is repeated, I actually get the product. Huh? So I now perform here repeated reinvestments. But for the next guy, I now have that this is the previous one. So the previous one was, okay, maybe I use screen because it is the previous one. The previous one was one plus L from T0 to T1 observed in T0 and now times the Delta T0. And now I multiply this with one plus L T1 to T2. But now observe, this is the important part in T1, okay? Times Delta T1. So I now do a reinvestment strategy and I use always the interest rate that I observe at the beginning of the period for the period from the beginning to the end. So I observe in TJ, for the period from Tj to Tj plus one. So then I can look at the value of this reinvestment strategy at all the time discretization points. So I have some kind of Ri, okay? So equivalently, I can write this with the instantaneous forward rate. Well, if the instantaneous forward rate is the derivative of the zero copper bonds or of the L's, yeah? then the L is the integral of the instantaneous forward rate. But it was not the derivative, it was the derivative of the logarithm. So you can actually just replace this guy here. You can just replace this guy, the one plus L times delta T, you just can replace it with the integral Tj to Tj plus one, Ftj, yeah? So recall this here is my little t parameter, the parameter at which we observe the curve, yeah? So this guy here is my Tj, yeah? As the one here. Uh, and then it's Ftj of Ftj tau 
d tau, yeah, integrated. Well, uh, of course, it is the exponential, yeah, because it's the derivative of the log house. Which means if you have a product of the exponentials, then this is an exponential of the sums. And then you see that actually this here is just a discretization, discretization of yeah, the whole integral save from T0 to, okay, where am I in Ti? F tau tau d tau and F tau tau is actually the short rate R tau. Okay, you can, you can check this, yeah. This is the slope yeah, at the starting point. Um, so what you see is that this here is approximately exponential integral from, from T0 to Ti to the endpoint R tau D tau. So you see that this here is actually the discrete analog of the guy exponential RT if R is a constant or exponential integral R of tau D tau if R is time, time dependent. This is the discrete analog of the guy which you already know from, for example, the Black Schultz model. Yeah? The accrual account, the bank account. So this is an important financial product. There is um, a deficiency here. I only know the value at the discrete time points. Yeah? I only know the value at the discrete time points. So it's not something R of T, it is R I, R of T I. But actually, what are you doing? If you make this investment, you are actually investing here in a zero Cooper bond that matures here. So you also know the values in between. It is the value of the zero Cooper bond that matures at the end of the period. So I can make a better definition when I use this zero Cooper bond. Before I make this, this is just a summary, yeah, that this guy is the discrete analog of this guy, which you know, yeah, the uh, continuously compounded bank account from the Black Scholes model. So this is just what I have written here in the corner yeah, that you have this on the script. And now I define the rolling bond. So I have the investment strategy. I always invest in the zero copper bond that matures at the end of the period. So this is now my R of little t. So I have some time discretization and I invest in the bond maturing at the end of the time period associated with the little t. So this is now my t0, this is my t1, t2, t3, okay. So my time is now in between such a period. I have invested from here to here in the bond that matures at the end. Yeah? So if, if this guy here is my Ti plus one, and this is my Ti, so then I just define a function that gives me for every little t the corresponding i. So this here is the I index corresponding to the little t. So this function is here my m. It is the index i, the largest index i, such that t i is smaller or equal little t. So this is for this t here, it's this i. 
so then I know that I'm in the period from TI to TI plus one. So then I have invested in the bond that matures at the end. So the end is M of T, this is TI plus one. So TI plus one. And I observe this little bond in little t. So this is the so-called short period bond. And how much money do I have invested? Well, I have invested as much money. So I have invested one. I have accrued over those times here. Yeah. So I just multiply with the product of all the stuff I have invested here. And you see also that the product actually runs a little bit um, further because this quantity is smaller than one. Yeah, but you already invested in one divided by mt plus one in the beginning of the period. So you end here in mt running from mt to mt plus one. Yeah, So the product actually runs over all these. Okay. Yeah. And these are one divided by the zero Cooper bond prices. Okay. So such that if you arrive at the end of the period, this will be one. And you have a crude one divided by the zero copper bond price. Now maybe you can you can you can check this little construction. So this is not a time continuous value of this discrete reinvestment strategy. Always invest in the short period bond, and this is called the single period holding bond. Okay, so maybe I make this guy here in the pink color, you know, then it's a little bit more consistent with my drawing. So the financial product B, which you know from the Black Scholes model, the E to the RT, yeah, or if R is time dependent, E to the integral R tau d tau is an idealization. It's actually the limit of this product here. If you make all the periods infinitesimal small and you have very small, tiny reinvestments, yeah? continuous reinvestment at the current short rate, the short rate for the infinitesimal time period. So you see that I always try to have side by side the continuous time objects and the discretized objects because later we will use the discretized objects. Yeah, of course, uh, the two definitions, 67, 68, they are equivalent, but the BTI does not coincide with the R of TI yeah, because of this time discretization. There is a time discretization error, you could say. You also see this from the measurability. Yeah? So if you go back here, this object here, this is a stochastic process. I integrate the stochastic process. So this object here is F T measurable. Okay. If you go here, yeah, you see that if you are, are at time uh, little t here, you invest at the end. Yeah. Or if you go back here, maybe it's better. You see that I go to the end of the period but I'm here at the starting point, yeah? So this is time ti minus one measurable, yeah? So I fix it at the beginning of the period and I invest to have the money at the end of the period. So there is a difference of the products yeah, in, in between these periods. Okay, so now to conclude our session, yeah, time is almost up. The interest rates are the basis for models, yeah? So now, all these quantities will become E2 processes. We have to think about what is the drift, what is the correlation structure. Um, different rates give different model families. So I have the forward rate, L, the discrete guy, which gives me then a discrete forward rate model, or also called discrete term structure model, the historical name, like a market model. Uh, the time continuous guy, the instantaneous forward rate, which will give me an heath shiro morton framework. So I have an infinite dimensional stochastic process. Yeah, So um, F of little t, capital T. And we had also the special guy 
the short rate which, which will give the families of the short rate models. All of these guys are interconnected, somewhat also equivalent. You can write the LIBOR market model as a short rate model. This is no problem, but it is not Markovian in lower dimensions. Yeah, yeah so there is um, a little bit of stuff, but all these guys are somewhat equivalent. Also because from all of these guys, you can derive back the zero Cooper bond prices. Yeah? So if you have this yield, you have that the zero Cooper bond price is, okay, the yield was the logarithm of blah, blah, blah. So it is the exponential of this yield. If you have the instantaneous forward rate, it is the derivative. Yeah, So the zero derivative of the logarithm. So the zero Cooper bond price is the exponential of the integral. And if you have our forward rates, at least I can get back the guys at discrete times by performing these products. So you see that in the discretization, there is a small issue here. Yeah, So I only get the guys at my discretization points in between there's a gap and the gap is that I do not model this short period bond. Yeah? I just model guys on, on the period, but not inside the period. But we can later also fill, fill this gap. Can I get back all the zero Cooper bonds from the short rate? The short rate is just a single stochastic process. Zero Cooper bond prices are a family of stochastic process. And here is the trick with the short rate model. Yes, we can. However, so there is an assumption. If you have the additional assumption that you know the short rate process under the equivalent martingale measure QN, where the numeraire N is exactly our bank account that performs the infinitesimal reinvestment at the short rate, then you can get back all the zero cover bond prices. So the reason is that if you have the numeraire, you can get back the zero cover bond by just using the universal pricing theorem. Numeraire multiplied with expectation under the probability measure Payoff, okay, the payoff is I get one unit of currency divided by the numeraire at the payoff time. So you can extract all the zero copper bonds from the valuation formula once you know the numeraire. And since the numeraire is given by the short rate, the short rate is enough to describe this. But there's a very strong assumption. You have to know the short rate under the equivalent martingale measure associated with the numeraire that is built by the short rate. So somehow like a, like a circle. So these models, you do not know the connection to the real world. Yeah? You do not know the connection to the real world because you do not have the link from real uh, objective measure to equivalent martingale measure. You just assume that you are already in this world. Okay, so there is um, this thing that we can also use the short rate as a model primitive and can extract all the silicon bond prices. So short rate models are somewhat a little bit ad hoc and um, we will study them. Therefore, yeah, not in the beginning because they are a bit special. Let me conclude with this nice picture that illustrates the different rates because then this section is done. Yeah, so maybe I can use a few more minutes. So here you see the three most important guys. Yeah? So we have the continuous time, instantaneous forward rate, the guy that enters into the Heath Show Morton, we have a nice interest rate curve. The time discrete forward rates, they are actually just averages where they are special average. One plus L times period length is exponential integral over F. Yeah, So there is some um, special way of averaging, but you see that L times period length is approximately like the integral. So L is one divided by the time period 
times the integral. So it's a little bit like, yeah, so I would, I should write here approximate, but it's approximate one divided by T, the integral from Ti to Ti plus one F little t tau d tau, yeah? So this is only approximate because actually it's one plus x on the left-hand side and it's exponential x on the right-hand side, but you know that exponential x is approximately one plus x, yeah? So one plus x is approximately exponential x. So you see that the L's are somewhat like um, averages and the short rate is just the single starting point. How does now the short rate relate to this curve? And you can show that under the equivalent Martingale measure, so the special assumption, the stochastic short process of the short rate has a special, a special uh, shape related to the instantaneous forward rate. It is that in the short rate process definition, so this here is how the short rate changes, there is the derivative of the forward rate curve with respect to capital T, yeah, observed, everything is observed now in T equals zero, multiplied here with dt. Yeah? So if you integrate this, the evolution of the short rate, integrating gives you R, is just follow the F. Okay, plus maybe some diffusion plus some Brownian motion. There is a little bit of additional stuff here, but this additional stuff here is, um, is small. For example, if sigma is small and it's just related to the measure transform. So um, yeah, so it's, it's the sigma, sigma to term. Yeah. Yeah, maybe we can forget about this and we see that the short rate should follow this curve. Yeah? So the short rate will somewhat follow here, this curve. And how is now this curve related to this stochastic process? Well, not the short rate encodes this curve, but if I take the expectation here, the expectation, and again, it's the expectation of the exponential. Yeah? So it's not exactly the expectation, but approximately it is the expectation. You get back this blue point. So the short rate is a stochastic process wiggling around this curve, such that if you do the expectation, you observe the right interest rate. What happens now if time moves on? Because all these guys are stochastic processes observed now in t equals zero. Yeah? I mean, this guy is not, this guy is now the process R of t, but everything that was before on the slide is observed, yeah, the point, the curve, and the averages observed in time t equals zero. So I have that the short rate wiggles around there, and now if time moves on, it is that this blue curve will move. So maybe it will move to something below or something above. And all these guys here will also move. Yeah? So maybe you have some movements of these guys too. Yeah? All these guys are now stochastic processes. So if we now move, then there will be maybe a new blue curve. Yeah? So maybe there's a new blue curve with new averages. And what does this mean for the short rate process? The short rate process will also continue to wiggle around here, but it means that if I move to the future, there was a path that I have observed that maybe this path here has been realized. Yeah? So this is the short rate path that has realized, and this is now the new future expectation, and the short rate process will continue to evolve now around this new future expectation. So you see that here, the short rate would be a conditional expectation, conditional to this point, yeah, I would get this forward rate, yeah? So you can extract the future forward rate at a future point of time via the conditional expectation. So it looks like that. Okay, so 
we will study this uh, in more details. Uh, for example, we can implement this in the computer and then we may have something like that where you can actually study this. On the right-hand side is now the blue curve. Yeah, The forward rate on the left-hand side, it's now the short rate. I start here yeah, and uh, we can we can study the properties once we have implemented these models. If you have not understand this picture, there will be another chance when we start programming the model and see how this evolves. That was it for today. Thanks. <laughs>